And we are back on Sportsman Radio. I'm your host, Chris Shanafel, and I am now joined by former NFL great defensive end who spent some time with the Atlanta Falcons and the Seattle Seahawks. He's a two-time Pro Bowler as well as being voted twice to the All-Pro team. He is Patrick Kearney. Thanks for joining the show, Pat. Hope you like the introduction. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, man. Uh, it's going great. I appreciate you having me on, Chris. So let's start this interview off, and I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about your college career as you attended the University of Virginia. Uh, you're recruited by Virginia uh, to actually play lacrosse, isn't that right? That's correct. I, uh, you know, kind of funny backstory and great in today's age of specialization for kids. I, I changed high schools to try to become a Division One hockey player. That didn't pan out, so I went to college to become a Division One lacrosse player, and uh, you know, football ended up being my calling. So, uh, you know, spread your bets. And, and how did you decide that the University of Virginia was going to be the best place for you? Uh, you know, they, they offered me uh, in early October of my senior year, and uh, just for the academic reputation it had, and uh, a chance to win a national championship in lacrosse uh, or in any sport for that matter. Uh, but the, you know, the chance to win a national championship was was very uh, very attractive to me, and uh, you know, it, it worked out great because Coach Starzy was a two sport athlete in college, and uh, when I did go to him and mentioned that I'd like to try football, was extremely supportive. And you were a part of that Cavaliers lacrosse team, and uh, you said. And as we know, you did play football at the University of uh, Virginia. But how did you start playing football? Was it something that you played in high school and you knew that you were pretty good at and you could play at the college level? How did that all happen? Yeah, you know, I started playing uh, organized football in grade and played just about every position except for quarterback. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was my, my first passion. And the high school league I played in, uh, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't known well throughout the country, so I didn't get recruited. And uh, so I didn't know if I was any good uh, or not. So uh, just the fact that I loved it as much as I did, um, you know, when I went to college and I agreed to play lacrosse, uh, I wasn't ready to just give up on something I cared so much about. And uh, you know, I walked on to the football team. Honestly, I expected to get sent home within the first week or two of, of training camp because, uh, you know, in my mind, every Division One football player was seven feet tall with lightning shooting out their eyes. So, uh, in my mind, I wasn't going to stand a chance. And next thing you know, uh, two weeks from the camp, they told me that I'd be playing as a true freshman. Yeah, you, you were a pretty good football player, to say the least. And I want to fast forward to your junior year where you recorded 45 tackles and eight sacks. And it was in your senior year where you re registered 62 tackles and 15 sacks for the University of Virginia Cavaliers football team. Uh, Patrick, I know this might be a hard question to answer, but what would you say is the most memorable moment of your college football career? Uh, it had to be my, my final home game. Uh, we had North Carolina at home, and uh, they were one of our two big rivals, and we handled them pretty well. Uh, they had Ronald Curry at quarterback, and he was the, uh, you know, the Mr. Football USA uh, who had backed out on his rival career to Virginia. So for this, this senior former walk-on to get to be able to, to beat the, uh, you know, reigning number one recruit in the country uh, was pretty special. But then the atmosphere was absolutely perfect. Uh, you know, just a, a crisp. Crisp late fall day, you know, the leaves falling off the trees and the crowd just going wild. Uh, it, it couldn't have been drawn up any better. And having all the odds against you, being a walk-on on the football team, when did you know you were such, you were such a talented athlete and would have the ap opportunity to play professional football? Um, you know, when they did tell me two weeks into my freshman camp that I'd be playing as a true freshman, and I also mentioned, uh, you know, we, they said, look, uh, you know, the way you run and your height and frame, we think if you spend enough time in the weight room uh, that, that you could be an NFL prospect. And at the time, even then, I was uh, somewhat cautious and thought it may have been a good carrot and stick routine. But nonetheless, I was, I was going to give it a shot. And uh, But my junior year, I was starting. And we were down at Clemson. I had two sacks and two forced fumbles. And uh, this was a time where the ACC was really putting out a ton of NFL talent. And it was at that point it dawned on me, look, I'm, I'm a difference maker at this level. And, uh, you know, making big plays against big-time teams, there's no reason I can't do it at the next level. And that's when it, it really sank in. Chris Schaffel here talking with former NFL defensive end Patrick Kearney on Sportsman Radio. And it was with the 30th overall pick in the first round of the 1999 draft when the Atlanta Falcons drafted defensive end Patrick Kearney out of Virginia. Can you tell us about your draft day and what it was like to officially make it to the NFL? Yeah, it was, it was a long day. Uh, you know, you're, you're always told pre-draft where you think you're going to go. And you know, I was sort of slotted a... 
you know, a, a mid first round guy, mid to late, who really wouldn't get past the Jaguars at 26. And, um, you know, it, it was, uh, the, the defense got pushed back that year. I think it wasn't until the seventh pick that the first defensive player got taken in Champ Bailey by the Redskins. Um, so uh, we all got pushed back, and four defensive ends got taken before me, uh, including one who didn't play his senior year, Demetrius Underwood. So uh, certainly some, some stings to the pride that day. But uh, nonetheless, it, it kind of turned out better. I, I you know, got picked up by the team that had just gone to the Super Bowl. Atlanta was a, a strong University of Virginia town and ended up being an awesome place to play and live for the first eight years out of college. During that rookie season of yours, was there any veterans on the Atlanta Falcons team that made you or any of the other rookies do anything, such as get a funny haircut, bring in food, sing in front of the entire team, anything extreme like they do nowadays? Um, yeah, they, actually they made me stop singing in front of the team. <laughs> uh, they, they, they could tell that I enjoyed it a little bit too much, so they, they, they banned me from that and stopped giving requests. Uh, I got a great looking haircut, which again they, they had to make me shave it because I liked it too much. Um, it was some version of like a patchwork mohawk, um, you know. And then you know, bringing breakfast every Friday morning. Uh, you know, they usually give me orders from about three different restaurants. I have to run around and you know make sure it was set at the table uh, in, in our meeting room by the time they got there. So it was good. Made me. Uh, you know, I look back on it with laughs, and uh, you know, made me appreciate the work that those guys have put in when, when they were raised by their veterans. And uh, it's all in good fun, and, and uh, I think an important part of the, the maturity process in the NFL. Absolutely. And Patrick, what would you say was the toughest transition you had to make from the college level to the professional level? Uh, you know, it was uh, kind of similar from when I went to, to high school to college. You know, you, you have to be a senior in, in high school, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of chumps on the field to pick on, so to speak. And when you show up at college, uh, you know, those, those chumps have, have disappeared. They got filtered out and weren't playing at that Division One level. Um, but then by your senior year, you know, you progress so much that you're finding plenty of chumps out there. Well, again, another filter sets in, and all those chumps are now working, uh, you know, uh, in something other than football, and so you're going against the best of the college ranks, and so you're having trouble finding the chumps again. Uh, so it's just uh, just adjusting and progressing enough personally that you, know, you turn you turn guys who you once thought were uh, quality players you know, in, into chumps. And it was in 2004 when you were voted your first Pro Bowl, as your name was already known at the time. It was uh, your first, your fifth season in the NFL, and you recorded over 50 tackles and 13 sacks. You also made it to the Pro Bowl in 2007 when you led the NFC with 14 and a half sacks, and you also forced five fumbles. Didn't mean anything to you back then, and doesn't mean anything to you now to call yourself a two-time NFL Pro Bowler. It does. Uh, you know, it didn't sink in for, for a, a little while, so I was out of the for a couple of years. But, um, you know, you, you realize that, you know, all it takes is one, one Pro Bowl nod, and you are a Pro Bowler for life, and no one can ever take that away from you. Uh, and it's, it's a, a level of the game that, you know, really a small percentage of guys uh, reach, even nowadays, where, you know, half the rosters end up uh, getting exempted because of Super Bowl appearances. But uh, it, it's a great honor, and, it's, you know, it's something my kids and, uh, you know, my grandkids and uh, you know, hopefully generations will be proud of. And Patrick, you know, I'm not just saying this because you're on the show right now, but you are probably one of my favorite defensive ends of all time, and i got to ask you this, you're, you're probably one of the most underrated as, as well. Uh, you've had many sacks, I believe over 80 in your career. Is there any specific quarterback that you like to hit more than others? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. You, you know, it, it, uh, the, the, probably my favorite one uh, would have been Aaron Brooks because he was my teammate uh, at University of Virginia, and we were co-captains together. So, uh, you know, it's always fun hitting a, hitting a former teammate. Um, and then, uh, you know, otherwise, I grew up a big Eagles fan, and so uh, anytime I went home to play the hometown team that I grew up cheering for, it was always fun to get Donovan. Nice, nice. Uh, Donovan is, of course, a guy here from Chicago where uh, I'm in right now. And, uh, Patrick, switching gears really quick, it was in February of 2007. You opted out of your contract with the Falcons, and the next month you signed with the Seattle Seahawks. Why did you feel it was best for you to move on, and uh, how did the Seahawks win the Patrick Kearney sweepstakes? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, the, 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 the Falcons, they turned 
off on the table and, you know, in, in meeting with my advisors, uh, we just, we just determined that despite how great the Falcons have been to me and how much I love living there and playing there, that, uh, you know, there's going to be uh, much better offers in the open market. Um, and so, uh, I guess as hard as it was to make the decision, I decided to test it. And, uh, you know, prior to free agency starting, I was, I was just about certain that, that Denver would be the place I would land. Uh, my defensive line coach, uh, who I built me as a player, um, Bill Johnson, who's now the Saints defensive line coach, he had signed with Denver. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was hard to tell him that I wasn't going to come there. I, I took my visit to Denver, uh, but promised to promised uh, the Seahawks that I wouldn't sign a deal when I was in Denver that I'd let them have their shot. And, um, you know, when, when it came down to it, I just I, I liked the uh, the veteran presence at quarterback with Matt Hasselbeck. Um, you know, I played against Walter Jones. Knew what a headache that, that can be for, for a top pass rusher. Uh, you know, they, they just were a well-balanced team. And uh, I fell in love with the city of Seattle right away on my visit. And uh, that, that, uh, that closed it out for me. And it was your first season in Seattle where you recorded those 14 and a half sacks, which led the NFC and then forced those five fumbles. Tell us about that crowd in Seattle. We hear so much about it, how tough it is to play in Seattle. How tough is it for an opponent to come to Seattle and play the Seahawks? It, it's brutal. You know, uh, Coach Holmgren told us a funny story uh, for those of us that were in rehab from surgery after our first season. Or after my first season there, we played the Redskins in the playoffs in the first round, and Joe Gibbs had recently retired. And uh, he said that, that Coach Gibbs had given him a call. He said, uh, Mike, so someday, when you're ready, I want you to let me know how y'all get away with piping noise into the stadium. To which Mike Holmgren replied, Joe, we don't pump noise in the stadium. To which Coach Gibbs replied, said, Mike, no, 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 when you're ready, you just let me know how y'all get away with it. He just, uh, he, he wouldn't believe him. Uh, it's, it's that loud, and, uh, you know, it's about 70,000 strong. And, I mean, we're, it's to the point where on the defensive line, uh, you know, you can't have stunt calls. You have to do hand signals, because even to my defensive tackle, who was four feet away from me at the top of my lungs, uh, you know, my, my voice couldn't reach him. <laughs> And, Pat, on April 13th, 2010, you announced your retirement from the NFL. How did you know you were ready to put up the cleats? Uh, you know, prior to the season, um, I had my second uh, shoulder labrum repair within 10 months. Uh, I was told that both my hips um, were arthritic with impingements and torn labrums. And, uh, you know, I was experiencing some, experiencing some pain, but that those injuries were putting limits on my training. I was no longer allowed to do squats below 70 degrees. I had to do all my bench pressing with a, a block on my chest so I couldn't go as far down. And, you know, all, all of a sudden, I, it just started showing up in my performance that I wasn't able to, to train with good depth on my leg movements. And, um, you know, my bull rush, I was no longer getting my, my helmet underneath the, the offensive lineman's helmet. I wasn't moving the pile the way I was used to. And, you know, frankly, I didn't want to be remembered uh, that way. And I would held myself to a certain standard, uh, a certain level of, of performance that, you know, unfortunately the, the toll that was taken on my body no longer allowed me to, to put on the field. And, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that just wasn't for me. Well, I got to say, you had a hell of a career. I, I really enjoyed watching you play. And uh, actually, just last month, in June, you spoke at the 2013 NFL Rookie Symposium, which I think is just great for you to do, great for all the veterans to do and uh, speak up there. What were some things you told those rookies? Well, I was, I was on a panel uh, that was put together of guys for whom you know the, the NFL did great things for. And I, I think guys have, have heard enough of the horror stories of, of the guys going broke and the guys having personal nightmares, whether it be in relationships or with substance abuse. And um, you know, I was fortunate enough to put on a panel that could show guys, look, this can be a great thing. Leverage this pop properly, and it can just it can make for a great life post NFL. Um, so you know, you know, a big thing I, I shared with them was well, two big things. One was on, on relationships, and that uh, you know, you treat everybody with respect. You, you know, the, a, the true this is the quote I used. The true revelation of a man's character is how he treats somebody who can do nothing for him. And, you know, these guys in their NFL careers, because of what they do, they have to meet some, some amazingly important people. And don't, they won't even know it when they're meeting them. But as long as they treat everyone the same, they'll treat that person with respect, and that person will probably be willing to help them when their NFL career is over. Um, and then, then secondly, uh, 
you know, I was just sort of talking about my passion and what my uh, consulting company I've formed since graduate school is all about, and that's financial literacy. And that, you know, over the past decades, um, we as athletes collectively have gotten our teeth kicked in by the, you know, financial services industry. Uh, you know, that and our spending habits uh, have just crippled us. And, uh, you know, if you want to remain financially illiterate, uh, you can join that time, or you can power yourself through education and start trying to talk. And, you know, Pat, let's go right there. Uh, you, you are in the finance world right now. <laughs> uh, what can, can you tell us a little bit more about what former NFL defensive end Patrick Kearney is doing nowadays? Yeah, I, you know, I put on presentations uh, for the Seahawks. Uh, I'm lining up with the Rams next year. Uh, a couple other clubs uh, spoke at the uh, at the symposium. They're also the NFL transition assistance program, and and just really trying to increase that financial literacy, helping guys dig uh, more to you know the true extent of their investments, and help them understand what risk really is. Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm someone speaking money for a high risk investment, I can put together a presentation to make it look low risk, um, and you know, NFL players need to be able to sniff out the, the, the poor assumptions that these fundraisers are uh, putting forward and say, sorry, you know, this, this isn't for me. Um, you know, let them understand they, they hit the lottery once by making the NFL. They don't need to hit it again. And we, we always hear about those stories about either current or former uh, athletes blowing their money on things they just don't need to uh, spend money on. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure they all appreciate what you're doing nowadays, Pat. I, I gotta say, it's been an honor to have you on the show. I have just a few qu uh, fun, quick questions to get to know you a bit, then I'll let you go. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Alright, Pat, what's your favorite TV show and movie? Uh, Modern Family. It is a layup for the TV show. Favorite movie? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, in any genre, I'd go ahead a river runs through it. Favorite thing to eat? Favorite thing to eat would, uh, let's see, which of my wife's recipes? Her, her Mexican lasagna is pretty dynamite. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I always tell my guests this. You can't go wrong with any Mexican or Italian food. I'll, I'll say that right now. <laughs> Favorite thing to do in your free time? Uh, in my free time, I uh, enjoy fly fishing. I'm movie, River Runs Through It, um, and uh, yeah, still very much in my physical training and playing two, two, uh, two uh, club lacrosse teams. Alright, and except for football, what is your favorite sport? We heard you earlier mention hockey, lacrosse, football. Again, except for football, what is your favorite sport? Uh, it's, it's, it's lacrosse. Uh, I got spring league and summer league that I'm on right now, and uh, still love the game. You're, uh, you're actually new to Twitter, at Patrick Kearney. I know you're still trying to figure out how to uh, work with it, but why did you decide to join the Twitter world? I thought it would be a great way to get messages across to professional athletes that, that want to increase their financial literacy. I spend most of it just kind of uh, putting out clip notes on, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal articles, Yahoo Finance articles um, that I think pertain to and can translate well to them. You know, if they get their spinning on them through you know, and looking at the unfamiliar terms on, like, uh, investopedia.com, that they can start having a, a fighting chance in terms of understanding the cost of their investments and understand the risk. If you're able to meet any famous person, who would that be? Uh, Adam. <laughs> As in Adam and Eve. <laughs> uh, it'd be pretty cool to meet the guy who was there when it all started. Yep, yep, most definitely. And last but not least, what is something about Patrick Kearney that many people do not know about? Whew. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm a guy like most guys who tried to have a child. I uh, was really hoping to have a boy, and now that I have a second daughter, I would be perfectly happy. <laughs> house full of five, six, four. Well, Pat, I gotta say, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Uh, I really appreciate your time, man. Before I let you go, is there anything you'd like to plug on the air for myself and our listeners? Yeah, yeah. you mentioned just, uh, any athletes that listen up or anyone else interested in social finance, just follow me on uh, PatrickKerner.com, or I'm sorry, Ed Patrick Kearney. Uh, and, uh, yeah, try to put the uh, good stuff out there for you. All right, thanks again, Pat, and uh, hope we keep in touch. Take care. All 
Alright, thanks, Chris.